everyone, welcome. I'm Paula Lant, and I'm really thrilled to welcome you to our fifth uh, seminar in our health policy dialogue series that we started this year with uh, generous funding from the Jane Kuskinas Ted Giovannis Foundation for Health and Policy. And we have Mr. Giovannis here with us today. Thank you again for your support. It's been great to have a number of uh, interesting and intellectually stimulating seminars this year. And today we are lucky to have with us one of our colleagues here at GW, Professor Jessica Green. Uh, Jessica is a professor and also the Associate Dean for Research in the School of Nursing, and she also is a professor in the Department of Health Policy and Management. <laughs> Jessica got her PhD from the Wagner School in New York City in Public Administration, and she also is a card-carrying public health person. She has her MPH from Columbia University, and we're thrilled you're here with us today and eager to hear about your research. So thanks for coming today. So it's a real pleasure to be here today and um, to be part of this, what's been a really great seminar series. Uh, I wanted to thank Ted Giovannis and Paula, who's running out the door, uh, for the invitation. Um, and what I'm gonna talk to you today about is some evaluation work I've been doing over the last several years, looking at a very interesting, um, very large pay for performance program that was implemented in Fairview Health Services, which is a pioneer accountable care organization in Minnesota. And um, me, along with my colleagues, Judy Hibbert and Val Overton, have done a mixed method evaluation of their uh, innovative payment model. Um, before I jump in, I'd like to uh, also acknowledge the Commonwealth Fund for their generous support of this research. So as you guys are probably all well aware, and I guess I should not <laughs> stand on that, um, most physicians in the United States are paid um, for the services they provide or fee for service. The more visits or procedures that they do, the more money they earn. And there's been a growing consensus over the last decade or so that fee for service payment <coughs> is a key driver um, of healthcare costs and really does very little uh, to promote healthcare quality and in fact, can impede um, quality improvement. As you see here, this is a quote uh, from the National Commission on Physician Payment Reform that was convened actually by the Society of General Internal Medicine, and they very strongly called for uh, a move away from fee-for-service payment. An increasingly common way to deal with this tension of fee-for-service payment encouraging more um, services is to add on pay-for-performance. So for those of you who aren't familiar with what pay-for-performance programs are, they pay providers for achieving certain benchmarks on quality metrics, or they pay providers for increasing or improving on certain quality metrics. And it's a very appealing concept. You're paying um, more for better care. Interestingly, the empirical evidence to date, and the empirical evidence really has been growing quite um, substantially, has found that there's while this idea makes a tremendous amount of sense, in practice, there has been only really a modest impact. As you see, there's Van Herrick um, did a systematic review and found a 5% improvement on quality indicators uh, on average. A more recent study by Roland and Campbell uh, concluded as a summary of the increasing body of work, it's clear that pay for performance can be effective. However, the effects are sometimes only short term and often not as large as payers wish. So one of the reasons that a lot of researchers have speculated that pay for performance programs have not been as effective as hoped for has been that there's not been that much money on the table. Um, there's been a recommendation that at least 10% of uh, clinicians' incomes need to be at risk for pay for performance programs um, to be effective. And this is what brings us to this um, this innovation from Fairview uh, where they put far more than 10% of clinician salaries um, based on quality performance. In fact, it was the base 
Base, their base salary, 40% 40, 40 of their base salary was based on quality performance. So before I jump into um, the specifics of the model, I will give you a little bit of background on Fairview. Um, again, it's an accountable care organization, actually a pioneer accountable care organization in Minnesota. Uh, they have 44 uh, primary care clinics and over 250 primary care providers, also a number of hospitals, but I didn't, um, this study really focuses on primary care providers. So they were an early adopter of shared savings contracts. In 2009, they worked out an arrangement with Medica, one of the local insurers, um, and they sort of co-created a contract that included payments for quality metrics. And then they expanded it with other um, private um, insurers. And once they had shared savings contracts, they realized they needed sort of to change the way their primary care providers were practicing and they moved to a group, um, sort of a more team-based model where the clinicians would come together and have what they called huddles and discuss challenging patients. And when they piloted this, a number of the clinicians said, you know, this is great, but it's, a little bit um, counter to the way that we're being paid on this fee-for-service basis. So they recommended that there needed to be a change in the, um, in the model for payment. And so Fairview charged a committee that included both administrators and clinicians to creating a model that was better aligned with the triple aim. So they rolled out the model in April 2011 and there were four components that made up clinicians or primary care providers' salary. Quality, which as you see is 40% of the base salary, and I'll explain what this base salary thing means on the next slide. Um, productivity, which was defined differently than productivity is typically defined, so it's not um, the number of office visits or procedures. Here it was a combination of panel size that was risk-adjusted panel size, as well as what they called patient encounters, which was both billable and non-billable interactions with patients. So if they emailed a patient, or if they had a phone call with a patient, that counted. 10% um, was based on patient experience survey data, and cost of care was supposed to be 10% of the model, but in fact, um, that was too complicated to actually implement and they moved to something called citizenship, uh, which is really sort of an assessment of what a, sort of how much of a team player providers were. Um, the other thing to note is that most of this model was based on the team level, which was really the clinic for primary care providers who are family practitioners or internists. There were a small number of pediatricians and so their team was across all of Fairview. Um, but as you see, the quality was all based on the clinic level quality. And I'm gonna break down now what this quality payment, 40% base payment really looked like. Um, so in Minnesota, uh, performance on certain quality metrics is publicly reported and required by the state. And so the, Fairview was able to use external benchmarks and compare clinic performance on these five diabetes, vascular disease, cancer screening, depression and asthma, performance in these measures to what was happening around the state. And what they decided was that 40% would if there was median performance on quality, providers would receive the median, um, the median salary for their specialty for that portion of quality. So let's say di the diabetes metric was 12% uh, of providers' income, base income. So if they had median performance on the <coughs> Diabetes metric, which is the D5, some of you may have heard of this, it includes having HbA1c in the normal zone, um, range, um, and I have the other metrics, uh, um, blood pressure, LDL cholesterol, being tobacco free and using daily aspirin. So again, diabetes made up 12% of base salary. If performance was median for the state, then 
providers would be reimbursed at the median level for their specialty. Let's hypothetically say that family practitioner's uh, median salary was $200,000, in which case if there was median performance, 12% of $200,000 is $24,000, okay? So and what you see here is these are the median payments based on this hypothetical for whatever percent these, um, the different quality indicators were valued at, and you see that they were different. Diabetes and vascular disease were each 12% of base salary, whereas the asthma was only 4%. And then you see that there's a tremendous range in which any clinician could earn for, say, diabetes. So if their performance was at the median, they would get 24,000, but if their performance was less than the 10th percentile, they would actually earn nothing for that 12% of their base salary. And conversely, if they had excellent performance at or above the 90th percentile, they'd earn 150% of the median salary. Any questions? Yeah. Slightly confusing. Well, if it's based on percentiles, yes, and that, it's a distribution. Mm -hmm. It's a relative thing, not an absolute. So that yes. means like ten percent are getting zero. Um, well, it was compared to initially. It was compared to the state norms, uh -huh. and then it was compared to the Minnesota, um, uh, the city norms. So it didn't mean necessarily that ten percent of these providers were getting zero, but there were providers within Fairview in their 44 clinics that fell into the less than 10th percentile on certain things as well as up to the 90th. And they, were, they did, um, it was broken down into deciles. Does that make sense? So yeah, this was pretty intense. Yeah, I, exactly. Layton. So, oh. You can only know performance after the period is expired, so are these sort of done as bonuses at the end of a year? No, so this was done on a quarterly basis and performance looked back over the prior 12 months. And so, you know, when we first went into the field to do qualitative interviews, it was six months in and there was a question of, well, will you see any impact? And since whatever any clinician was doing at any given time was going with their patients was gonna have an impact on their quality for the next 12 months, the impact was very, very quick um, of this program. And it, yeah. Other questions, because this is complicated. In fact, one of the findings was that providers found this incredibly complicated. Okay. Mm -hmm. These are the only five, six, five areas that they were measured on to quality. That's correct. <clears throat> so our key evaluation questions were how do, um, how did primary care providers react to the model uh, in terms of quality, productivity, their work environment, and what was their response to the team level quality incentive? There had been a lot written by economists and others sort of speculating on the benefits of having a team level incentive, um, but very little empirical evidence of what uh, the impact of team versus individual incentives really was, as well as uh, how they're experienced by actual clinicians. Um, we also, of course, wanted to see how much improvement there was on the quality metrics, and we were able to compare that to other delivery systems uh, in the region because, as I said, uh, there's public reporting of quality metrics in Minnesota. Um, we wanted to look at which primary care providers improved the most under the model. And finally, we wanted to see if, whether there was an impact on socioeconomic disparities in quality metrics. As I mentioned, it was a mixed method study. Um, hold on one second. No, no, no. It just occurred to me that I meant to bring this up so I knew how I was doing in time. Okay. Um, so it was a mixed method study where we did in-depth interviews with primary care providers as well as administrators at two times. Uh, the first time was six months into the program and the next time was about a year later. Um, and the goal was really both to understand their experiences, um, 
so that we were understanding what was happening, but also because we were doing surveys with the providers. And as we found the existing surveys uh, on <coughs> Uh, providers' experiences with pay for performance didn't really talk to these folks' experiences, so we needed to really develop surveys specific for them. Um, and then we did two rounds of online surveys with primary care providers. You see we got response rates a little over 50%. Uh, we got a decent number of people, 150 or so each round. And then we had administrative data on the quality metrics from Fairview. So we were able to look at performance before the implementation of the program as well as two years into the um, implementation and looking at the same clinicians. So those clinicians who stayed there for the same, for two years and look at their uh, change over time. Okay, so now we'll start on the results. Um, the first thing I'm gonna show you is the reaction of primary care providers uh, to this model in terms of, again, quality, productivity, and work environment and their perspective on being incentivized at the team level. So this is data um, from our first survey, uh, which was about a year into <coughs> implementation. And as you'll see, about half of the primary care providers reported that the uh, payment model had positively influenced the, their own quality. I always loved the fact that slightly more thought it had influenced their colleagues' quality. Um, almost all reported reaching out to patients more intentionally. Uh, one provider explained, we're thinking about how to reach out to our population to find them. Previously, medical care was based on who shows up in the office. We have an impetus with this model to find those patients who aren't coming in. 87.5% uh, reported an increase in ensuring patients were up to date on quality metrics, even if it was, the, uh, it was unrelated to the purpose of the visit. Uh, a clinician explained, even if they're coming in for a non-asthma visit, we have them fill out the asthma control test if they have asthma. You get a score that gives you some idea, roughly, of how they're gonna do on the current frequency of symptoms. So it may lead you to change something at a visit you might not have done otherwise, such as when they're coming in for a wart. Um, so it, it sort of, it seemed to quite a bit change um, the way people were practicing. Though I do want to point out that while 50% said it had improved their quality, there was 42% that said there was no change and a few people said that this was really sort of a, a not positive thing. Um, we asked about PCP's per, um, perception of the impact on their productivity, the number of visits, uh, patients they were seeing per day. And um, in the first, this was done in the first survey, and we asked them uh, basically how many patients they saw per day now and how many they had seen um, before the compensation model. And there was about, um, you know, they went from 18, uh, from 20.1 to 18.5. So they were very much acknowledging uh, that there was a cut down on productivity, which Fairview, by the way, was very much feeling. Um, they had, uh, they were, as an organization, as a delivery system, they were still being paid largely uh, based on fee-for-service. And so this ended up um, creating a number of problems and they actually had to change the model somewhat and they created a bonus for providers who were had high productivity as well as sort of a floor. So um, it wasn't, it was basically, it was a little complicated, but they basically said if you're uh, productivity wasn't at a certain level close to the median and it was it changed over time um, you couldn't earn much more you couldn't earn as much based on high quality as you otherwise could so essentially there was pressure in order to benefit from high quality to also have reasonable productivity um, the reasons folks described for the reduction in uh, productivity. One was they said that doing quality really took a lot more time. Um, the other was uh, there were some primary care providers who really described trying to like fit in as many patients as possible. There was one in particular who described coming in sort of 
opening up his schedule and sort of trying to really pack his schedule as much as possible, but that under these incentives, there was no reason for him to work that hard and really push himself quite like that. The perceptions of impact on the work environment um, were pretty mixed. The most felt that the model had improved effectiveness of working together with a team, um, but there was also quite a number who felt the tension was up. And um, one thing I, I didn't mention earlier was that the, each provider's quality metrics were um, transparent to the rest of the people in the team. And so someone said, you know, people see your numbers and you don't want to be the worst guy on the block. So not only were people being paid based on their clinic performance, but they knew who in their clinic wasn't doing particularly well. 64% um, reported decreased control over compensation, and this was something uh, that was a very strong theme that came out again and again, and we'll see it and again in a moment, related to the teamness. Um, but a primary care provider explained, it's difficult to change your partner's numbers and difficult to improve numbers on patients that can't afford their meds and aren't motivated to change. And as you see on the bottom row, um, I think that's this impact on satisfaction is really quite fascinating because it was, it really shows how divided people were about this kind of model and that it seemed to speak to some people, but a minority, right? Um, it increased satisfaction for almost 29%, uh, but the majority said their satisfaction was decreased. So we didn't initially intentionally start out thinking about this team, uh, well, uh, about I, we wrote a paper really just focused on the team um, component, and we didn't initially think that, um, I mean, we were interested that it was a team-based incentive, but we didn't realize how much this would come up in our interviews, and it just came up again and again. Um, and so when we, <coughs> um, where is my finger stuff? Sorry, here we go. Um, so when we did our second survey, we actually asked providers if they were creating the incentive, how would they break it down? Would they make it all individual-based quality? Would they make it all team-based quality or some kind of hybrid? And we gave them a number of options. And three quarters of them thought that it should be a mix because they thought that you needed some team-based to maintain collaboration, um, but you also needed to recognize individual performance. Um, People really viewed pros and cons of the team-based incentive, and it wasn't really like there were some people who only saw the pros and some people who only saw the cons. It was just really a mixed bag for folks. Um, for the, the benefits, people really thought it brought uh, providers together to really like took people out of their silos and were working together. One provider said, we're all in this, trying to make patients healthier, so we're working together and I'll work harder with my partner's patients when I see them. Um, there were also a number of people who talked about the fact that with this kind of model, um, the team-based model, there'd be less dumping of patients or trying to say, patient, why don't you go see, we're not a good fit, maybe you should go see this other doctor. But if you went to an individual model, there'd be much more of that. Um, the cons was truly this issue of lack of control over the compensation. People were, got very, very frustrated and felt fundamentally, you know, it, it was back to Paula's point about this, this is intense. So if you have providers, colleagues whose um, quality is really quite poor, um, and you don't feel like you have control and this is your compensation and it's changing on a quarterly basis, um, it, it just has really major implications. So um, one person said, my main frustration is the quality numbers that they base my salary are on, uh, are on the clinic's quality numbers, not mine. So I can be a rock star at everything and it just doesn't matter. Um, and then again, there was a lot of mixed feelings around the team dynamics. There was more reaching out to help each other, um, but there was more peer pressure. And someone said, some people tend to be very independent and resent this. We've lost some people. There's been a shuffling. It doesn't speak to everybody. So 
summarizing, we found that about half of the primary care providers reported the quality improved, um, and there was a much greater focus on population health, uh, quality, and supporting colleagues, but productivity dipped, and <coughs> work satisfaction um, decreased for over half of folks. Now I'm gonna turn to talking about how much improvement there was on the quality metrics themselves. And I'm gonna start by showing you data from Minnesota community metrics um, from 2010 to 2012. And the dark blue uh, bars are Fairview pre and post. And then you're seeing, comparing it to uh, three other delivery systems. And what I'll say is sort of overall, I'm imagining you're not saying, wow, Fairview's improvement is off the charts here. In fact, what you see is Park Nicolette, uh, which is these purple bars, they, on vascular disease and diabetes, they started higher and ended up higher uh, and had more improvement. So it didn't look like this large incentive translated to these huge improvements that folks had hoped for. We unfortunately don't know what was happening in these other delivery systems, um, but we're pretty confident that they weren't having a larger financial incentive. When we look at the data on, um, from Fairview's data on quality metrics by provider, so we were able to track the 139 <coughs> primary care providers who had vascular disease patients, um, both before the implementation and two years later, um, at, and for diabetes and cancer screening, what we see is that there is improvement in all three areas. Um, but as you may remember, cancer screening made up 6% of base salary, and the improvement is the greatest. Whereas the diabetes and vascular disease made up 12% um, and there was less improvement. Now this may be incredibly intuitive, Getting somebody in for a one-time cancer screen is a much easier thing to do than to get people to do these five diabetes metrics, um, including stopping smoking. But it is important to realize there is this notion that if you throw more money at quality, you're going to get more impact. And that is just not what we saw here at all. There's, it's a just much more complicated story. Um, so the summary here is that our providers improved in quality, uh, but not more than other delivery systems. And we didn't see a relationship between the size of the incentive and the amount of the improvement. And what I forgot to point out on the last slide is we did see a narrowing of the variation in quality. So while everybody improved um, some, so we see improvements, um, the, the standard deviation on quality metrics for all three metrics are lower at the end than they were at the beginning, which is good. So everybody's doing better and there is less variation. Um, our next question and second to last question is which providers actually improved under the model? <clears throat> and this question was important to me because you know, we keep seeing that these programs aren't that effective. Is it something, I mean, if we figured out who they're effective for, maybe that would help us um, better target them. And what we found across all three metrics very strongly was that those with the low baseline quality improved. So I'm gonna show you the vascular disease case. And what we did was we looked at um, we divided the providers based on baseline quality into three terciles. And we looked at their mean baseline quality at, at baseline, as well as their mean follow-up quality. And then you can look at the change in quality. And it's very clear that the people who started out at the lowest had the biggest uh, improvements, whereas those uh, that started out with really high quality had very little improvements. But I'll point out their quality was still higher. Um, there's something about this group that is doing something incredibly impressive, treating patients very, very well, um, regardless of incentive, essentially. And this is something that I'm really interested in exploring next is, is what is it that they're doing with their patients? Um, or what is it about their attitudes that has made them so consistently good? Um, because I think as you'll see, or as you're seeing, this 
throwing money or incentivizing doesn't seem to necessarily be the answer. What we need to do is figure out how people really achieve this incredible high quality and then figure out if we can replicate it. Um, we found basically very mixed findings or no, no relationship between improvement based on the type of provider, uh, the type of patients they saw, uh, although there was a little mixed um, findings on gender and um, primary care providers with younger patient panels had more improvement on cancer screening. And so the last question was whether there was an impact on socioeconomic disparities in uh, quality metrics. And what we have here is um, the gap in the quality metric between the providers in the top, um, the, sorry, the last slide I just showed you, um, oh no, no, here we go. All right, uh, let me <laughs> backtrack there. Okay, so we looked at the quality metrics for the providers whose uh, patient panels were the, the, um, the wealthiest or had the top third um, income based on their zip code as well as the bottom tercile, and we looked at the gap in those quality metrics. And as you see at the baseline, we see gaps for each of the three metrics. So again, this is, um, what this is saying is that the primary care providers who were treating higher income patients had better quality metrics at baseline than did their colleagues treating lower income patients. Um, we still see a gap at follow-up, but we see a substantial reduction in that gap if you look at it percentage-wise, um, but even um, in absolute value, uh, absolute, absolute numbers. And the reason we found this is that you've already saw that those who had <coughs> lowest baseline performance um, with their quality, those folks happen to disproportionately see lower income patients. So when they're the lower quality providers quality improved, they were improving the care for those patients who happened to be lower income. As a result, there was this narrowing of the gap in quality between primary care providers treating higher and lower income patients. And I know I was a little bit unclear there, so does anyone have a question that I can clarify? Makes sense, okay. Um, so, Overall, what we found here is that this model fundamentally was a lot less effective uh, than what had been envisioned and hoped for. Um, more money on the table did not translate to more quality improvement. Um, it created a lot of frustration a lot among many of the primary care providers, and there were some unintended consequences, really mostly around the reduction in um, in traditional productivity or RVU billing, which impacted Fairview's bottom line. So this study really underscores that payment reform is complicated, and it may not be the magic bullet that many um, have envisioned. Um, and in fact, Fairview decided um, that the model wasn't achieving its goals, and in the third year of the model, got another group of, again, clinicians and administrators together to develop a new model um, that was better aligned with how it was paid, so it became much more based on RVU productivity. And as you see, it dramatically reduced the quality portion of the payment from that 40% of base salary down to 6%. Um, they changed the team-only quality assessment of performance to a 50-50 mix between individual performance and clinic-level performance, and they tried to simplify the model in a number of ways by reducing the number of me metrics, reducing the number of thresholds um, for meeting the metrics. Um, and so this is actually quite, still quite new, and I, I hope to be able to continue studying what happens with them, but I have not been studying it right now. Um, 
Here are some references if anybody is interested. We have recently published, um, I guess, three papers and we published one uh, a year or two back. So this, if you're, there is more, but um, with that, I think I will turn it over to Avi and then I think there'll be questions after Avi, that's right? 